Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Polish House Davos 2020. Free this year's main theme in Polish House is Poland Bridge to Freedom. This slogan, this theme emphasizes Polish humanitarian help to Ukrainian uh, refugees, but also we are talking about unlocking the potential of this region and also how to use technology to uh, create more secure worlds. In the previous panel, one of the panelists stated that we need space to protect the Earth. Probably we're going to discuss now that we need to protect uh, the Earth and using technologies to do so. I am extremely uh, honored to present to you the speakers in this panel who are, let me, let me maybe show us um, the speakers, uh, Ms. Kaisa Olongren, Minister of Defense, Netherlands, Ms. Dominika Bettman, Microsoft Poland, um, Mr. Um, Dr. Helmut Rezing Gerf, Palo Alto Networks, uh, and the whole region of Europe, Africa, Middle East. Mr. Oleg uh, Derevianko, Information uh, System Security founder. And last but not least, Mr. Mark Boris Adrianic, European Institute of Innovation and Technology. The panel will be moderated by Ms. Uh, Joanna Świątkowska, CEO of European Security Organization. Joanna, to you. Thank you so much, Magdalena. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the session that is going to be dedicated to, to the cyber dimension of the Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, my name is Joanna Świątkowska. I represent Exo-European Cybersecurity Organization, uh, uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to, to, to serve today as, as the host for this session. Few words about EXO, about the organization that I represent. Um, so basically, we are, we are a go to association when it comes to cybersecurity in Europe. We bring together the key stakeholders, both from the private and public sector, uh, and we cover almost the entire full spectrum of cybersecurity topics, starting with a, with a tech oriented analysis, certification, um, uh, market development, and policy issues, uh, among the others. Uh, what is important is that we were launched in 2000. 16 as a con contractual partner with the Euro European Commission to introduce a uh, quite unique back then program on private-public cooperation in, in cyberspace and we are continuing this mission to currently lead the project that helps and supports the European Commission to build so-called cybersecurity communities across Europe. Uh, the reason why I'm saying that is not only to auto-promote myself ourselves a little bit but also to, um, to explain why we believe that it, we are in the right place to run discussion about the topic that requires public-private cooperation. And I guess that this is going to be the main theme for the panel today to understand not only the insights behind the utilization of cyberspace during the war uh, in Ukraine, but also to understand what can be done better in uh, the area of public-private uh, cooperation to basically boost our security posture, not only in Ukraine, but beyond. Uh, so as, a, as the moderator of the session, I'm privileged to set up the goals for us for the discussion today. And exactly one of them is going to be to understand the state of play better, but also to speak about hopefully actionable recommendations that we can pass to the world and, uh, and, then, and, and jointly discover what can be done to make us all safer. So that's, that's, the, that's the job for us uh, uh, today. And I mean, we are obliged to do that. We are in the Polish house uh, where uh, the ideas turn into action. So I guess that we need to live up to those expectations. Um, all right, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's kick off. And I would like to really start with the question directed to uh, Mr. Derevianko, simply because with your presence, we will be able to understand more what is the cyber threat landscape in Ukraine right now. I mean, actually, if you could tell us and explain how do you see uh, uh, the situation since the beginning of the war? Like, what are the main threats? If you can say a little bit about the, the most significant cyber attacks and uh, maybe also what surprised you uh, since the beginning of the conflict, how the cyberspace is being utilized. And also, if I can add uh, one another element to the question, how the country has had been preparing themselves, your, yourselves, um, uh, before the outbreak of the war. Sir, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, and thanks for having me here. Uh, Cinco Barzo. Um, let me just 
maybe clarify a little bit? You mean from the beginning of the war, you mean the February? Because I if we go back to 2014, I can tell a lot uh, about the cyber attacks. But you mean the really this this phase of the war, right? Although, as you as even Microsoft delivered within the one of the latest reports, like the the the, the actions, like the preparation for the cyber attacks that actually were launched exactly in February, um, uh, I mean, that started way, way ahead, right? Oh, 12 yeah. months ago, if I, if I remember correctly from the report. So yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah. Yeah, I think we need to touch a little bit though on, on 2014, 15 and 16, because it creates the kind of the continuity of what was going on. And that's, I think it's essential uh, for our, for better understanding of how to address these issues. Uh, because, I mean, Microsoft's defense report 2020-2021 showed us that uh, Ukraine was, you know, in 60% of attacks targeted Ukraine, right after the United States, which is a little below that than 50%. And you can compare that then the third place, probably third place is UK with probably like 9% of attack. And, and very famous countries like Israel for cyber technologies, they have attacks in 2% of the time. Uh, or, I mean, 2% of the attack, at least if we count. Of course, of course, we don't count all the attempts. It's always a question how you count an attack. Or you count all the attempts on the network operations or, or, or only, you know, the intrusions that were detected or those attacks that actually ended up uh, being broadcasted in media. Uh, but if we go back to 2014 and uh, when the uh, state actor attacks started to, to, to take place in Ukraine, we could also go a little bit back to 20, 2008 when Russia waged the first cyber war, it was Estonia. Uh, sorry, yeah, 2007. 2008, it was Georgia when they were the f for the first time uh, used cyber operations combined with conventional military operations in 2008. Uh, then fast forward to, uh, to revolution of dignity of Ukraine and the cyber attacks that started to happen in 2014. Uh, the, uh, if you remember, the first one was attack on presidential elections. Uh, and fr from that moment, we continuously see the increase, uh, or soar, I would say, the increase in number of attacks, and to some point uh, in, in, in the sophistication of those attacks. But this, the word sophistication probably is a little bit tricky because uh, sometimes um, when the attacks were portrayed in media or, or even in some reports by certain cybersecurity companies. Mm, and that's one of the issues that we need, uh, probably jumping ahead, to address in the industry, that sometimes those reports for various purposes, sometimes for marketing, sometimes for the need to raise some next investment route, are a little bit, mm, how to say, um, not 100% accurate. For example, if you look at power grid attacks that happened in Ukraine, uh, in, I, when I even speak to many cybersecurity professionals, a lot of them still think that there was some magic malware that that actually, you know, uh, caused the blackouts in Ukraine and so on. Whereas uh, there was uh, the malware was, of course, present, but it was a really, really long-term manual attack until they got to the point where they were able to deploy the malware. Uh, and, and that's uh, important to understand. And, and if we look at the current period where we saw probably the three times increase in number of cyber attacks, but of course we didn't see the, the same increase in number of intrusions or breaches. We in our security operations center for the first couple of months, we saw probably 60% increase in number of alerts, but it didn't correlate with the number of incidents whatsoever. So. Um, uh, but uh, what we what we uh, saw, like from, from you know in this recent period, that all those attacks that really resulted in in significant incidents, th these attacks were those attacks that were the uh, Russia or various proxy groups that worked for them already had access in the systems from from 2021. Uh, or the the latest, the January attack of 2022, which we call the war message attack, right? So when, if you remember, at the mid of January, there was a significant attack predominantly on governmental web resources, another supply chain attack, another software company, a small company that were that was breached and then used as a as a as a vehicle to 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 do the attack. Uh, a couple of, I mean, maybe uh, 
there are many different technical things that I think that we are speaking more for the general audience and, 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 it's, uh, and it's not the, the, the venue to speak about like really like technical details. Uh, but, uh, but, we, but maybe like just a little, a little um, some couple of comments on that. We, uh, since 2015 and 16 and then 17 with Infamous Not Petya, uh, which again, if you remember, they, they basically not Petya. They 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 didn't use any new tools. They basically used all the same tools that they used before. But that time it was combined and automated. Uh, and uh, and of course, using Wiper uh, as a main kind of destruction technology is what we see as well these days, right? So they, uh, however. Uh, recently, they uh, instead of using various, you know, they probably used maybe you know half a dozen different, maybe around ten different kinds of wipers, but uh, but then they switched to using predominantly just one, KD wiper, and uh, but they always, of course, modified it in order to to uh, to uh, bypass the, the 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 protection, the real time protection measures. Uh, and and you can see that of course uh, there are still the same the same techniques the same kind of phishing attacks that work of course now the period which is very favorable for phishing attacks because you can really quickly agitate uh, you know, people to click on something when you deliver the news uh, from the war or some that really the news that people are waiting desperately to to receive uh, so uh, phishing is still there. Uh, the uh, the attacks on edge devices, uh, which some companies say it's a new thing, we don't think it's a new thing. There were edge attacks before, and quite significant, back in 2018 as well. So they basically they continue. Maybe one of the th thing that is, uh, well, kind of a surprise, right? So is that uh, because uh, to undertake a really uh, resultful an impactful uh, cyber attack, it takes time and you need to have access and you need to really gradually and slowly escalate your privileges uh, inside the infrastructure in order to not to be detected. Uh, we are, uh, they, they were not capable to execute many of them, but in the times of war, of course, I can imagine that they also have their chain of command. They also need to report to somebody they're doing something. So they started to racing and rushing and, and doing multiple attacks, which are basically like a noise, you know, like they, they're trying all the time to penetrate and, and they use enormous quantities. But, uh, but, but these are, you know, of course, it creates a workload on, on security professionals. But I wouldn't say that they, they kind of surprised us significantly with anything. But it does doesn't mean that it's not important, right? Uh, I would probably, I, I've been speaking for, for a long right now, so maybe in the next round I would ad address the how Ukraine was preparing, but let me stop for now here. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for shedding the light on the, on, the, on the current situation. And to be perfectly honest, my question was kind of a tricky one, because when I asked uh, if there was anything surprising to you, um, I was kind of alluding to the fact that very often right now we tend to understand that maybe for a while we even overestimated the capabilities of the adverse advisory, uh, adversarial threats when it comes to, the, to their you know, capabilities and, and possibilities. Sorry. I'm pretty sure that, yeah. Yeah, look, but here, well, just one sentence here, because when we say about, I'm really worried that when we say about overestimation, that we're not end up with underestimating the risks. So that's, 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 that's absolutely that's correct. And, and I'm pretty sure that we're gonna follow up exactly on this topic. However, just for a while, I would like to maybe zoom out a little bit and speak about the international, international um, dimension of the, of, the, of, the, of the topic, simply because, I mean, it's almost trivial to say, I mean, like the, the Russian war in Ukraine takes physical place uh, in that country. However, like the, entire international cyber security, security community is also impacted, especially when it comes to the cybersecurity domain. Um, needless to explain the, that interconnectedness and supply chain dependencies, they, 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 they lead to the situation when the attack on Ukraine can impact all of us. And so I would like to uh, take this opportunity and address question to Madam Minister to ask how countries, how other countries are preparing themselves to tackle this challenge? And also, what do we do at the international level? 
Yes, it, it's a very important question, uh, uh, and I think it was good that we had a sort of an overview of the of the last um, uh, decade, uh, because it's not something that's just happened now. Uh, we are seeing a uh, highly interconnected world, global supply chains that are interconnected, uh, very uh, fast developments in technology, uh, and um, and also warnings. Our intelligence community has been warning about the possibilities uh, that it offers to uh, stately actors uh, and others uh, who will use everything they can, uh, hacks, zero days, uh, everything to, to, to get into the systems and to be in the systems uh, and to use it when, when the time is right. So from, from our perspective, defense perspective, national security perspective, uh, we have been warned. Uh, and we have worked on this, and I think that the, we as an international uh, community, and especially the European Union and also uh, NATO, um, uh, we have also we have uh, put up high fences. Uh, and I think Ukraine is an excellent example of that, because it, it could have been much worse uh, in Ukraine. Uh, but therefore, you need, uh, you need resilience, you need public-private cooperation. We cannot do it on our own on the public side. We need uh, the private, we need the, the, the companies, the high-tech companies uh, in there. And you need international cooperation. It's not a field uh, where you can work nationally. Because we in the Netherlands, of course, we have a national cyber security strategy, and we need one. But more importantly, we need a European one. We need to have an international response within NATO. We have need to have uh, rapid response teams to actually act uh, when necessary. And I, I remember a year ago, as you mentioned, when uh, Ukraine saw this very high increase in, in cyber attacks, uh, the international community was also there uh, to help. It's not always visible, but that kind of cooperation is extremely, uh, extremely important. Uh, and I think we should, we, we have to, we cannot underestimate the speed uh, of the developments, and that's something that is sometimes difficult to keep, keep, keep up with when you're talking policy and lawmaking, etc., in, in Brussels and also in our capital cities. Uh, but we have to keep up with it, uh, because otherwise, um, we ha I mean, we deal with countries like the Russian Federation and others who, who have well, not the same view, or let's say, on uh, what is legal or not legal. Um, uh, and, and that's a big threat to us. And I think that is where we also have to get our fences higher up. Uh, so th that kind of resilience can only be done jointly. And like I said, and that's why it's interesting to be in this panel with so much uh, private companies, because that public-private partnership has to come from two sides. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for those, uh, in my view, absolutely fundamental remarks. And I'm pretty sure that there will be a chance, uh, looking at the time, to come back to s uh, some of the elements that you just brought, brought up, Madame, simply because, I mean, like, at the European Union level, we are not only see this increased uh, activities when it comes to the uh, development of more regulations and legislative proposals, but also um, interesting initiatives to also boost political response. I'm uh, uh, sort of referring here to the to the current work on the uh, refinement of uh, cyber diplomacy toolbox with the interesting political to tools that can be used in order to stop the stop the aggressors at the political level and I'm s very happy to come back to that later on uh, during the discussion but right now maybe I'm continuing on understanding the point of view of a person that is also not only uh, an expert in the field but also uh, brings tremendous experience from the political point of view uh, mr and Janic is uh, former uh, minister for the, uh, of digitalization. Um, uh, so you do have, sir, uh, uh, an, in, uh, in great overview of those two fields, private and public, mm, and expert knowledge as well. So I would like to use this opportunity and ask you about your view on the uh, slightly different um, conclusions as, as and, and, and debate that is like, right now carrying on among researchers when it comes to the understanding of the essence of the utiliz utilization of cyberspace in the military area. What I mean by that is that before the war, 
many researchers and experts in the field, they sort of uh, assumed that cyberspace space is going to be used not only as a supportive element to the military activities, but maybe even as a, um, uh, the, the, the main element that is going to decide upon the results of the conflicts. That, that we, we, we don't see that currently in, in, in Ukraine. I mean, like, so either we, again, overestimated the power of cyberspace, or maybe we underestimated the, the preparation of the country, uh, which is pr proving that the resilience is at the incredible level. So how would you comment on that? Sun Tzu, many years ago, said, if you know yourself and if you know your enemy, you're not going to lose in 100 battles. And what's been said before, it's absolutely true. Ukraine has been fighting cyber war with Russia since 2014, which means that the country has been able to boost its capabilities in this time, realize Russian tactics that are involving, but are becoming more and more predictable, and prepare proper contingency plans. So there was no element of surprise, and everyone who knows the theory of war, be it a kinetic one or a cyber one, will understand that the element of surprise is absolutely, absolutely crucial to victory. Um, and there was no such element here. Now, what's important to highlight is that uh, Ukraine has proven incredible digital resilience on a number of fronts. Cyber, res cyber attacks, or let's say cyber defenses, are just one of them. Um, if we look at Ukraine's digital government, what the country has been able to achieve in two years of war is more than most European countries fail to achieve in decades of peace. I'm talking about DIA app, which is, I dare say, one of the best government apps in the world. It has proven to be incredibly resilient. I'm talking also about a number of other very important government services that allow citizens of Ukraine to carry on with their lives and work much easier than otherwise. Um, now, big thanks here goes to, on one hand, other governments and the international community that really helped Ukraine throughout the past decade or even more. On one hand, I would really emphasize the role of Poland. Poland has been absolutely critical in this respect. I know that firsthand I was a minister when the, broke up, when the war broke out. And I know the efforts of Minister Cieszynski and others in making sure that there are data centers set up in Poland that host the most critical data from Ukraine um, and that Starlinks are coming in a matter of hours from Los Angeles, not months. So um, I would say the only real Russian success was actually to put down the satellite network in the beginning of the war. Uh, but again, this was a temporary success. Um, Starlinks came in very soon, and this is again a big, I would say, area of gratitude that goes to private companies that played an important role here. Microsoft is one of them, but there are also many others that ramped up defenses of Ukraine's critical infrastructure and their government systems. Um, now, truth be told, um, all of this help wasn't a wide way street. Through Ukraine, we learned a lot about Russian cyber capabilities and cyber operations. So when I talk to military uh, 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 experts, they're saying that actually they benefited more, I'm talking about the international community, than the help and support that was given to Ukraine. We really, I would say, are able to understand how Russians and similar actors operate now. And I think this is very valuable for any kind of future challenges. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, to all of us, I guess, especially in Polish house, it's obvious that Ukraine fights not only for themselves, but also for all of us. And, um, and uh, that, that it's also true for what we, uh, what we will gain and what lessons learned we will, uh, uh, we will have after, you know, like the war also from the cybersecurity uh, point of view. So, uh, so uh, I fully agree with that. And I would like to actually follow up on one element the, from your intervention, sir. And that is, of course, about the role of the private sector in the, in the, in the 
uh, in the in conflict. And um, here, I mean, we are again in the Polish house, so I would like to also take this opportunity and um, strongly recommend you, all of you to get familiarized uh, yourself with the recent report that was created by one of the Polish think tanks that deals with cybersecurity, and that is the Kościuszka Institute. The title of the, of the report is The Twi Twilight of the Neutrality of Digital Technology. And uh, like the main conclusion from this report is to, uh, is to notice that military conflicts these days, they are not only limited to the state actors and more and more they bring on board and impact on many different ways the private sector, which in many cases serve as a first responder to, 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 to the threats and then basic plays the role in the national security providing assistance in terms of the critical infrastructure protection, I don't know, citizens protection, you name it. And uh, Microsoft is, of course, a very good example of uh, a company that, was la that, that has been very active in this field. Um, so mm, even recently, the company announced that you're going to continue your support for free for entire 2023 uh, just to help out uh, in Ukraine. But it makes me wonder, I mean, I would like to, again, take a slightly broader perspective and try to understand what does it mean for the corporate responsibility and uh, the future of C CSR in this, in this area, simply because it, it is opening up like the entire new avenue of the, of the private uh, sector engagement. So I was just curious to hear your comments on that. Absolutely. I, I, was, I was told many times that corporate social responsibility died because it was a kind of uh, marketing activity. And obviously this perception uh, was everywhere. And I believe today we do not even talk only about enhanced corporate social responsibility. We talk about much more. First of all, uh, it's, it's a human thing to help others in need. So I believe those uh, very basic, very human feelings uh, are at the beginning of any activity in companies because for companies it's people who are working there. So, so, so we perceived the, the, the war in Ukraine and we still do uh, as a bad thing happening to our neighbors. How can we stay there and refrain from being active? Uh, impossible. So, so, so I believe that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, um, resources, people, and technology was involved in order to help. Those resources could have been placed elsewhere, but company like mine decided uh, to do what, what we did. So I believe we are no longer talking about an add-on. We are not talking about an additional activity to what we are doing every day, but what we managed to achieve is to enhance the sustainability into our strategy, into our operations, into daily activities. So for people who were enthusiasts of sustainability, th this is really happening now. So, so I strongly believe that uh, the paradigm here is changing. When Microsoft decided to help Ukraine with moving about uh, the data of about 20 ministries and 100 um, government institutions to the cloud, the idea was to do it immediately, as was mentioned before. Uh, some preparations were done before, but no contractual issues, no long negotiations, no business as usual activities were taken, but the operations were in place and the data was uh, placed in, in the cloud. And we talk about something like cloud shelter or data embassy, uh, just to protect data, so people will uh, protect it in the countries, first in the neighboring countries and then uh, around Europe and elsewhere. Data was protected in, in obviously secret places in the cloud for the sake of uh, protecting it. So I strongly believe a new quality of relationship between business and government is being born. Uh, and I, I do believe uh, we will talk sustainability and we will talk how to proceed because it, it's not only about resilience, it's also about perseverance. As uh, when the war started, uh, people tended to believe it will end in, in a month, uh, maybe in six months. Uh, now we are uh, 
one year later and, and no real um, due date for the end of war in Ukraine. So uh, I believe that this perseverance is now uh, the, key, uh, the key topic where uh, the security and the cyber security needs to be delivered uh, throughout months or even probably years. So uh, I do believe it will be an ongoing activity strongly supported by government and and the business and based on trust. How to achieve trust is uh, the entire question in itself. Uh, and um, again, I mean, uh, I, I, I personally believe that the perception of the um, cooperation between the private and public sector is changing also because of what happening, uh, what is happening in Ukraine. And clearly we see that there is no other way, right? So, uh, so th we are having this like a very speed up lessons of how to how to start to speak with each other more openly and then more, more transparently. Um, but again, I mean, I can see certain changes, but I guess that we, we still need uh, we need to maybe incentivize the process. Something that that is also uh, a, an interesting element for the further discussion, for which I hope that we will still have time. Before I will move to the very la last question from my side, I would like to also encourage our audience to think about the questions that you might have to the panelists. Simply because I would like to keep this session as interactive as, as it can be. So just after this question. I would like to open up uh, the panel to the potential Q&A. Um, uh, but again, the very last question in, the, in, the, in this, this first round of the, of the debate comes to uh, Dr. Reisinger, if I may. Sir, um, you do bring quite a unique perspective to the table simply because Palo Alto, Palo Alto is constantly observing rapidly changing uh, landscape of the threat uh, of, of the threats uh, coming from cyberspace in Ukraine. Uh, with your um, uh, Unit 42 threat, threat intelligence, you are constantly providing um, key stakeholders, but also to some extent the public with the overview of what's going on. We've had at the beginning of the panel um, uh, some information about what is happening right now, but I'm more interested in your uh, view on possible trends, how the situation can evolve based on what you see right now. Yeah, thank you so much. First of all, um, if I want to echo, because you started off with cooperation, private sector and public institutions, for every company there is a time, there is a moment of truth. And you can decide, is it either pro-freedom or pro-aggression? For us, this is a no-brainer. And that's why we are quite honored to support uh, the efforts here. Now. I think overall what we're seeing is that this conflict situation shows us that data never before is playing a crucial, never before has played such a crucial role as now. Hmm. And together with data, it's the protection of data, which is cyber resilience. And what we are seeing is that in general, geopoli and you know, when we talk about data and digital, we talk about the digital attack surface. And it's growing massively. And our Unit 42, Threat Intelligence Unit, actually has portrayed this. We see it since 2019, a massive increase, more than 130% of nation state attacks. Now, nation state ex attacks per se are not targeting primarily the wallet of my colleague here. They are targeting disruption and impact on the society as a whole. So maybe impact on defense related topics, maybe impact on critical infrastructure. I come back to that because we need to see the conflict in, if you want, on the battleground, but also in the wider aspect. Another drive is, of course, and you mentioned that also, the software supply chain attacks. Because more and more, you can use software, because it's coding, 80% contain open source components, and if one of them contain malware, infiltrated maybe by a nation state, uh, itself, then you have a snowball effect that is spreading. As it was with uh, via Sad and, uh, and the effects in the in Germany, right Absolutely. on the on the wind turbines. Now, what we have seen also as a t as a uh, trend situation is that, of course, you have more and more connected devices. Our security product, and we are both. The reason why we are number one globally is because we are in network security, in cloud security, and in endpoint security. Now, an endpoint can also be an armed vehicle; doesn't have to be always our. Uh, tablet that we are carrying with us. And therefore, having consistent security across these domains, network, cloud, endpoint, and then using artificial intelligence 
to filter what is a real alarm versus what is just noise is extremely crucial. We as human beings cannot do that. So that's the evolution on the threat landscape. What do we see in the actual trend line that is going forward? First of all, we need to say that we've seen a lot of activities that went into collecting data, instruments that have been put in place either in the defense sector in Ukraine or into uh, critical infrastructure. This can be utilities, this can be uh, hospitals, where you're trying to collect data for later usage. Next point is, of course, you're trying, not you, you, the bad guys are trying to target networks where people are connecting to. You mentioned the great DIA application where 18 million people, if I think, of Ukraine are connected to and are using it during complete conflict time. If there is no connectivity, hmm. there is no citizenship, and that's also an impact in terms of resilience of a country in a given conflict. It's not only on the battlefield, in the wider sense. So this topic, I believe, is extremely crucial. And then the, uh, what we see as well that has been heavily used, you mentioned the word, which is wiping technologies. Whilst we see in private sector ransomware attacks, it's primarily um, uh, multifaceted extortion, which means I threaten if you don't give me the data, then, you, uh, then well, pay me money, otherwise I keep the data and encrypt it. Then the second step is a shame list where people are actually publicized or organizations whose data has been uh, leaked. But what we see there in such a conflict situation, it's many more wiping uh, topics that have been seen and deployed. And therefore, I believe we need to see now the resilience. Resilience comes with consistent network, cloud, endpoint security approaches because data is flowing through these points. So if you have fragmented, if you have yeah. fragmented solutions, uh, you have much more risk to carry. Another piece is it's not only about the battlefield; it's also about the wider aspect in terms of the um, uh, critical infrastructure that also needs protection. And there are good initiatives. I mean, something in the mid-term, long-term would help a lot is the NIS2 uh, 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 Direct. perspective directive from, from European Union. Absolutely will help. It doesn't help immediately when you have such an aggression happening tomorrow. And therefore, I think the good private plus public cooperation helped a lot in that sense. In a wider sense as well, what we need to be aware of is there is the immediate impact on data, but there's also information influence you, somebody mentioned before there was uh, a referendum was influenced, okay? That's critical as well in such a situation because you need to keep the support for the people who are suffering. And therefore what we have seen is there was quite some influence in states outside of Ukraine to change the public opinion. And therefore also here, cyber resilience overall plays a crucial role. And I believe, and that's, I really would end on a, uh, first of all, chapeau to what has been done in the country both from all the organizations that, that are active there, but also I think what should us make optimistic as well, that the democratic processes, sometimes it takes time, but what we saw there is this was an extremely time pressured situation and actually the democracy stood extremely quickly and strongly together. Very optimistic uh, remark um, uh, uh, at the end of the first round of the questions. Thank you so much for that, sir. I think that we all need it these days. I'm uh, taking a look at the audience and um, uh, encouraging you to uh, start asking your questions that you, uh, for the issues that you would like to get to know better. I, I can see the first one is coming in. Uh, thank you for a very interesting conversation. Um, in Ukraine, we see one more layer of warfare, which is disinformation which is uh, new tools in cybersphere where we try to where hostile activities try to distract people. In Ukraine, we do address it. I'm wondering how do you see this information in Europe? What kind of, do you see as a part of national security? Uh, do you see it, it as a cyber threat? And what do you do to protect your citizens from a hostile disinformation activities? Thank you. Maybe if I, I can react to that, uh, yes, we, we see it as, I mean, disinformation is used to, um, in, in Ukraine, for instance, trying to, um, to attack the morale uh, of the Ukrainians, but also in European countries like, like the Netherlands. Uh, we know that efforts are being made to influence and to find issues that, that are uh, uh, polarizing. So, uh, and it can be any topic. 
Uh, it could be, uh, for instance, in the Netherlands, we have a debate with the farmers. So we know that it's being used as a topic to divide people. Uh, and that is happening in, in many, many countries. And we know also that uh, where this happens, uh, you, can, you can just keep on trying. And it doesn't matter if it works, but at some point you will hit uh, and you will, you will get the, the debate and the polarization and the divide that you need. Uh, and I think, and that is, that is one of the uh, most important things for now, is that we keep our unity. Unity within the European Union, unity within NATO. Uh, and that is why we have to be so uh, vigilant, I think, about uh, the way that, that this is, is being used, because we are all liberal democracies, uh, and we have freedom of speech, uh, and we have political debates, uh, and that means that there is room, that there is a lot of room to, to say whatever you want. It doesn't necessarily have to be true for you to say it. Uh, but at the same time, we have to also teach uh, children uh, and young people to distinguish between what is real uh, and what is fake, and what is a debate, and what is an attempt to divide us. Uh, and it, but it's very difficult, especially for liberal democracies, to do that. And I think what we've seen in the past years is that also the, the, the platforms, the, uh, the, the private companies, ha have stepped up, uh, are doing a much better job than before in, uh, in, in trying to adapt the algorithms, uh, to get fake news out, to, to, uh, to show that it is actually fake news. And of course, every now and then, like we have the debate now on Twitter, uh, the, it's coming back. Uh, so we have to be also, as politicians, we have to remain very vigilant on this issue. Thank you so much, Madam Batman. Uh, from a company perspective, I think the part of the answer, <laughs> the answer is difficult, but part of the answer is technology democratization and skilling. It's very much about uh, how citizens are trained, prepared, uh, to be alert against uh, cybersecurity risks. Uh, the, the perception should be uh, not only that it's government who needs to protect us, or it's my bank who needs to take care of, of the cybersecurity, it's also about my behavior. So bringing the uh, right attitudes among citizens uh, belongs to one of the topics, and that's what, um, what Microsoft I is doing with the skilling programs. While launching one in Poland, we, we initially thought we would address experts, cybersecurity experts, and then we realized that citizens, entrepreneurs, are very willing to participate and to learn and to skill their people in order to interfere with the risks we are discussing here. Thank you so much, sir. I would give another interesting example of Ukraine's cyber resilience. Now, even when the Russian tanks were rolling in the outskirts of Kiev, the city was online and the banks were operating, which, for example, wasn't the case in 2014. Now, um, when it comes to the DIA app, and again, I can't emphasize enough how much this kind of digital tools are contributing um, to the success of Ukrainian campaign, um, for example, you can report the damage caused by Russian missiles through the DIA app. You can even report Russian movements by sharing data and pictures of Russian tanks on DIA app. And I think around 2 million Ukrainians even watched the FIFA World Cup final through the DIA app. Now, what can we do at the European level to boost our cybersecurity capabilities? NIS2 directive was mentioned. We were very much actively involved in negotiating it as an EU presidency country. ENISA is being strengthened, which is good news. Um, but again, the biggest responsibility still lies at the member states level. And our biggest challenge is how can we bring top cybersecurity experts in the public sector? These people are in incredibly high demand. They're the most sought after experts who can offer, who can get paid three times, four times, even five times as much as we can offer them in public service. And here, countries like Poland came up with quite an ingenious plan, a special remuneration system for public sector employees who are cybersecurity experts. And that allowed the government to recruit good people and to retain them. We did something similar in Slovenia by establishing a military reserve made of cybersecurity experts. We know we can't afford to pay them full time, but we can call them in when the crisis arises. 
So I think that's important. Now, this information, I dare say that Russia was more successful traditionally and today with their disinformation campaigns than with their cyber operations and conventional cyber attacks. Not necessarily in Europe, but definitely in the global south. Russia realized very early on that disinformation is the cheapest way of asserting influence on countries around the world through the most popular social media platforms. And that also explains, to a certain extent, the attitude of the global south towards the war in Ukraine, which is unfortunately, in the best case, neutral. Now, um, I think Digital Services Act will help in this respect. I also believe, as was said before, that the platforms are stepping up and realizing their responsibility. But for me, the biggest challenge moving former, forward is the AI-enabled disinformation. Bots and deep fakes that will be very difficult to distinguish from human ones. This, I think, will be a major challenge um, that needs to be addressed, not just by the platforms, but also by governments around the democratic world. Thank you so much. So please. Yeah, and I believe this skill point that you have raised, I can only echo that because that's why we have a program as, co as well as called Cybersecurity Academy where we help particularly the public sector in whichever country to develop those skills. What I think as well is striking in this conflict situation is the cooperation aspect within the society in, in, in Ukraine. You had very good skills locally already. Mm -hmm. I should say this to my European fellow here. But also that you did crowdsource all the information as much as possible. And again, that's an important part in cyber resilience, which is you need to consolidate the data, that you can actually really distinguish noise versus good data that you need or bad data that you need to kill. And um, talking about cooperation, we are, as you know, we are uh, a private company, but we work closely, this Unit 42 that you said, whenever we have those attacks, situation or when we are called in into emergency situation, then we work with the law enforcement agencies. And one thing that I see across Europe is the closer you get to the Ukrainian border, the higher the level of alarm is from governments on digital cyber resilience. Interestingly, the United States president about, is it now eight weeks ago, has issued an executive order that every federal government entity needs to do and I spoke about attack surface before, an attack surface analysis every seven weeks. Now, there is an Atlantic Ocean in between, but you see there is this awareness of we need to protect our critical infrastructure. There is a lesson learned of this oil pipeline, uh, colonial pipeline that, that uh, didn't work anymore. And I think that shows again, if we just imagine gasoline stations would not operate for two weeks in our Western democracies, this would be a tough stress test for governments and therefore the cyber resilience with the skills the cooperation private and public i think is certainly something that needs to be done with full awareness always of the attack surface that's critical thank you so much is there any comment from your side on on, on those topics i can only agree with what was said i just want to emphasize nobody uh, executes cyber attack for a sake of cyber attack uh, I mean, maybe some script kiddies, you know, cyber attacks are always executed for some purpose. And if we saw before more and more attempts to, to uh, uh, sabotage attacks, you know, to disrupt operations, especially in critical infrastructure, but I think uh, we would see more and more uh, usage of cyber instruments uh, to, as, a, as an element of a larger information influence operations and psyops. And uh, there would be more and more hack and leaks attacks. Uh, there will be more and more faked hack, hack and leaks attack when you basically can fake it that there was a successful attack and then, then leak certain forged uh, documents and uh, uh, and then portray. I would I, I'm, I would like to go deeper into this information details, but we'll have a panel in the Ukraine House at, at 5:30 uh, <laughs> on that. So I'm speaking there this too. Is how so we <laughs> have been hijacked a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I think that we need to when we talk about this information. Just once more, we we shouldn't underestimate, but the, because there's a new kind of uh, phenomenon of disinformation used in social media and fake news and stuff like that. But there are also traditional very, very, very sophisticated, strategic 
foreign influence operation and disinformation. And give you one example. You and I don't like this term, the West, but I will use it now for you know to not to count all the country. The fear in the West of Russian nukes. This is the result of deliberate disinformation campaign of Russia in order to prevent the West from helping Ukraine. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any other questions coming from the audience? We do. Uh, thank you, Magdalena. In a conventional sense, uh, both countries haven't used their best weapons, nuclear ultimately. Do you see Russia having some type of cyber attack that they haven't used yet? And secondly, is quantum computing attacks that are coming, is that the nuclear uh, example of what cyber attacks will be in the future? Quantum <coughs> computing attacks. Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, in, in terms of the overestimate and underestimate an issue, and uh, yeah, we can always have a discussion about zero days. And of course, there were zero days before there would be zero days in the future. Uh, just unknown vulnerabilities. We in our practice as ISSP, we, we always assume that our client is compromised. And for me, actually, the distinction between cybersecurity, I actually think that the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the information systems protection, uh, the IT systems protection, is the, basically an IT kind of function. The real cybersecurity starts from detecting the, uh, the, uh, the incident when the, all the system failed. Right uh, or or do the right incident response when we have a detection and we had a lot of examples in in Ukraine during these months when, for example, you have a, a alert from Microsoft Defender or Palo Alto or other technologies, but then the issue is that how deeply you go in, with your incident response. If you if you was not deep enough in your incident response, you will have the next attack very soon. And there were several cases like that when, when the, the company would think that they have mitigated uh, the risk and that they eliminated the attack, but then but they didn't go deep enough and, and, and the adversary just you know, uh, prevailed there, so they kept their presence and they were able to execute the next attack. Uh, that's why for me, quantum as a tool to crack your, you know, password in order to get inside is just another <laughs> another way to get inside. So you need to be prepared when someone is inside, whether it's an uh, external adversary or it's an insider threat, or whatever you can imagine. Uh, and when quantum computer arrives, uh, we don't know, but we will. We would just need to assume that the adversaries will always be able somehow to get inside your system. Uh, it's just the speed of how you can how quickly you can detect them and how quickly you can respond uh, that differentiates and that's exactly what differentiated the companies in Ukraine from successful in cyber and not successful this one thing and the second thing those companies because in Ukraine uh, I, I well there's the term national cybersecurity right but it's a cybersecurity of a national systems and ministries and so you're helping but at the end of the day the cybersecurity of each country is a cybersecurity of each specific organization and if we're talking about critical infrastructure many of them are private or state-owned enterprises that behave and their decision making is like private company decision making and uh, and then the question is that whether the company is mature enough, and we need to talk more about cybersecurity maturity in order to actually be able to compare the different prepared, I mean, different level of preparedness to respond to cyber attacks between different industries or different organizations within one industry. Because organizations are so different, like human beings, they're almost like all the same, but, but uh, fundamentally, but in details, we're all very different. And that's the same you know, with, with, with machines and systems and infrastructures. Well, I guess uh, that there is a good reason why we sort of start to uh, have started to speak more about resilience than cybersecurity only. I mean, we need to expect the worst, right? Uh, and wh whatever reason brings us to the situation that we need to deal with the potential consequences is uh, almost a secondary uh, issue here. Um, uh, I don't see any other questions, so and we are do approaching the end of the panel. However, I would like to maybe ask uh, all of our panelists to end up our discussion with um, maybe one idea or recommendation on how we can keep continue 
helping Ukraine when it comes to cybersecurity. I mean, uh, as we've heard already, uh, a lot of companies stepped up uh, in the past providing immediate help for 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 uh, for Ukraine and um, again even at EXO at my own uh, at, at our own uh, organization we saw that our members immediately started providing assistance in terms of tools in terms of services uh, but we need to find a sustainable way on how to help maybe it's uh, about technology again maybe it's about uh, human resources but maybe it's also about political tools to, to to help out so what would be like your recommendation as for going to the future if i had to say one thing i would say cybersec and general security is a team game uh, which means and i think it was expressed in our discussion how important it is to cooperate uh, public uh, and private uh, citizens of the nations also, uh, open communication. So everything that brings people to cooperate and to work together. Thank you so much. Well, I think in this war, uh, we have seen uh, Russia make uh, many mistakes in the beginning. So they have not been able to use their cyber tools uh, to the full. Uh, and they have made uh, multiple mistakes uh, also with uh, letting their military use their mobile phones, calling, calling home, etc. So we, I think we will have to expect that they will stop making those mistakes and that they will start using uh, the technology. So what we can do from a political perspective, I think it's very much in the sanctions to make it difficult for them to not have any access at all to our technology because we know that our technology is superior to what they have themselves or what they can uh, get elsewhere. Uh, so that is one thing uh, that we uh, can do. And, this, and, the, and the second thing is uh, also be prepared for this. Uh, they're, uh, they're going to learn from their mistakes. Uh, they're also going to use cyber. They're going to use AI. They're going to try to mislead. I mean, we see a war with artillery and very much uh, old-fashioned warfare going on with lots of lots of lives. But also, uh, don't forget the air attacks. Don't forget the drones, uh, the UAVs that are being used. But there, they can also use technology and cyber. Uh, and I know that Ukraine is prepared for this, but I think everything we can do to help in that field will help Ukraine in the war. Thank you so much. I'll be very short. We need to do everything we can for as long as it takes. And uh, at the same time, we need to, as citizens as, and organizations, pressure our governments to send the most modern weapons to the Ukrainians. This will, in the end, win the war and stop the needless and tragic suffering that we are witnessing every day. Thank you so much. Uh, first recommendation short term would be stay realistic. You never know what you don't know. And uh, like what the lady minister said, second topic is increase the cyber resilience within Ukraine as well as outside Ukraine on critical infrastructure. That's an indirect impact. And um, the third thing would be a midterm one. I think there will be a lot of investment coming into Ukraine because probably when we talk about cyber uh, skills, it's one of the best skilled tool uh, pools of resources that is there across Europe and across the world, actually. It has been anyhow already a powerhouse for IT, but with this, I believe, it has become as well a very strong resource pool on, on cyber security. I think one perspective that we should give midterm is there will be major investments coming as well in that front. Thank you so much, sir. Well, I will try to be practical as we're a security operations company. So, uh, I would say if you're a large organization or enterprise, uh, make sure you have the incident response plan, which is practical. Make sure that you have uh, the maturity roadmap. If you're a small company and you cannot afford expensive solutions, find something, you know, and there are a, little, you know, a lot of different innovations now are available, how you can address it, you know, find virtual CISO, but, but operationalize cybersecurity. If cybersecurity is not operationalized, if it's just a project by project thing, it doesn't work. It's a process, it should be operationalized. And, if, and the last, but not least, I would echo here, and we are also big fans of this approach, uh, uh, is, is would be basically know thyself, know your attack surface, both from out, outside in, but also from inside out. Do your cybersecurity health checkups regularly, 
like real, like, like in depth, like do your cyber MRI, you know, not just not just pen testing. I'm I'm talking about uh, continuous and regular compromise assessments, attack surface assessments, and then from that build your roadmaps and build your operations. Thank you so much. From our end, uh, I can uh, promise that EXO will keep continuing advocating for um, uh, cooperating more with Ukraine when it comes to the European level. And of course, we will do our best to mobilize all the uh, other partners and members to, 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 to invest more in the, into, the, into, into, into this support. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Bridge to Freedom, this is the main theme for the Polish How This Years, and I guess that we uh, heard uh, a lot of uh, hard lifting uh, messages coming from uh, the stakeholders uh, and the speakers representing all sorts of different sectors. So I'm pretty optimistic when it comes to the future. I hope that we will just uh, maintain our uh, commitment to support Ukraine, as you said, said sir, also in the, in the long term. Thank you so much for joining this panel. It was an excellent discussion. Thank you so much for, for staying with us and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, please join me in the round of applause for our speaker. Exactly. Thank you.